Uh, welcome everybody uh, to another freestyle um, mobile mentor session with Sam and Randall. Um, we talked last time in our video around. Hey, um, Sam, I'm Randall. <laughs> How dare you? It looks different on my screen. Um, and the joys of working on Zoom and working at home, I'd like to punch Randall um, through my screen, but I, I can't quite do that. Um, we talked about we talked about um, Windows 10 last time, and um, you know we we largely just focused on the security side. So we thought we'd explore that in a little bit, little bit more detail. Um, we're also joined by Jason Ferguson, who on my screen is below. Um, hi, hi, Jason. Um, and Jason's had a whole lot to do with um, you know, Windows 10 um, new deployments or, or um, customers looking to deploy new laptops um, into their business. And we're talking in um, small numbers and up into the thousands of devices as well. So Jason, without further ado, I might pass over to you to give us a bit of um, a brief on you know, some of these projects or programs of work that um, you've uh, been undertaking recently and, and what some of those challenges or um, decision, um, decision making processes customers have been going through. Yeah, sure. Look, thanks guys. Thanks for having me on board today. So look, Windows 10 has been one of those, um, one of those platforms that everyone's talked about for, for a long time. Um, you know, the, the decision to go to Windows 10 from Windows 7 uh, was largely you know, thrust upon us by Microsoft with the sunsetting of Windows 7 uh, at the start of the year. Um, so largely the decision's been around, do you carry forward the, what you used to do in legacy or do you look to modernise and, and really take advantage of what Microsoft are bringing forward with their Windows 10 platform? And look, what I've seen with various organisations is, depending on the complexity that they have in, in the business processes, not just the complexity, but also the confidence and expertise and knowledge that they've got around you know, what those business processes are, what they do and how they actually use them, has really driven which way they choose to go. Almost unanimously, customers have a desire to move towards modern management. There's still a lot of uncertainty around what does that really mean. And when you look at the various posts and, and dialogue that Microsoft released, it, it's a little bit unsurprising. Some of their um, some of the communication can be a little bit vague or ambiguous at times. But um, largely, the, the organisations that have gone to modern management have found that this transition to working from home that we're all faced with right now with coronavirus has been far simpler. Organisations that have had to quickly pivot and, and get people working from home that have got a SOE or a MOE in place have really had to scramble and make quite a lot of concessions around, you know, around their security posture. You know, do they have a VPN in place? Can they actually get updates? What do they do in, in six months' time if the device has been off network? And it's that's a, that, Jason, that's a really interesting one you, you, you mentioned about a VPN because last um, discussion we had, we talked about um, VPNs um, oh, sorry, we talked about pushing out security patches and that if you've taken your device home and you're on a SOE, um, that you wouldn't be able to do that. I think probably a correction from last week was you know, VPN, um, if you do leverage a VPN um, on a SOE, then yeah, you can probably push out patches, but there's challenges with that, Randall. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's not going to be ideal. I think VPNs we saw largely failing, didn't we? Yeah, well, look, it's how much traffic do you want to shove through it? Like a, a VPN generally in most businesses has been for the 10% of the workforce to get back to the legacy on-prem systems to do a, a little bit of computing work yep. not to deliver patches, right? So getting data from a, a system in a back-end service and then I used to have 100 people on it and now I've got 1,000 people on it. It's already overloaded. I might have had to buy some more licensing to get, bring up some capacity and now say, well, now I'm going to deliver a, a one gig patch to yep. everybody. You know, how am I going to stage and roll that out? Because now I'm starting to impact on, on people's work time versus yeah. um, you know, smart throttling of, of a direct download like we see with smartphones. Yep. So, you know, your smartphone says, hey, I've got a new update for you. I've already cleverly downloaded that in the background while it was sitting there overnight charging or, or something to that effect. So we yep. should really look to the same methodology as that rather yeah. than you know, dialing back to the infrastructure. Well, that's right, because essentially... You know, with a VPN, if you're going to send out an update, it'll almost be like, I mean, you know, um, everyone took their photos to get developed, um, so they'd all be going to the shop. Um, and now you're saying, well, you know, just email your, um, all your photos to us. Uh, that's yeah, well, look, it, it goes in further. Now, that's, that's a big, big VPN type issue, but, but yep. you know, one that hit me personally just yesterday, as an yep. example, is, is my kids go to school. Uh, they don't go to school. They're, they're schooling from home. And... Uh, <laughs> 
a, an incident happened at the school yesterday morning, that, which is they changed the, the web filtering gateway, which I'm very thankful they have. Yep. Uh, and that basically bricked everybody's PC. Uh, yep. So uh, the workaround was, here's an email to all parents. We're here until 10 o'clock tonight. Bring your PC back to the school and we'll, we'll fix it. Uh, now, when I was talking with the guys, it was a DLL that had to be removed. It was a five minute job per PC. Yep. And DLL is the exact opposite of a patch. It's not right. many megs, it's many KBs. Right. It's the tiniest of tiny things. But once again, the ability not to be able to manage that over the air is actually you know, the, the challenge that, that's being faced. As I look at the three phases of, of Windows 10, obviously provision, you know, and we largely used to do that inside the domain and set up a standard operating environment and an image and, and many months spent on that. And if I can use the school as an example, that is the you know, January timeframe, IT, you know, kids at school, let's get all of these imaged up and ready to go. Yep. And we'll, let, we'll freeze it in time at that point. Then you've got the patch that we just talked about. How do we you know, manage it over time? Uh, and you know, obviously when you're on domain, you can smart schedule and you've got enough pipe and, uh, and you, know, you can roll it through different groups of the SOE. Um, and then ultimately is manage, and that's what happened at school yesterday, was uh, the, the ability to make a change, whether it be to a, something that's not directly part of the OS, in this case, a web filtering gateway, but it, it downloads, obviously, and changes a configuration file, which then wasn't able to be changed uh, back again without physical uh, representation of the device. So I think, you know, the, the real catch cry here, is, as Jason talked about there earlier, is it's been thrust upon us, but Windows 10 is designed to be managed from the cloud. And, and yep. uh, I've got this uh, yep. thesis I'd like to, to put forward, which I might uh, try and see if I can inject in a slide at, at some point, is that devices are born to look left yep. or born to look right. Uh, left, I talk about being the infrastructure and right is the internet. So an iPhone's a pretty simple place to go to. It was born to look right. The first place it needed to look was iTunes and, and, and Apple servers to even activate it, if you remember right back to the early ones, you need to activate your phone via iTunes. Um, whereas a BlackBerry was born to look left. The first thing it wanted to talk to was the BEZ server, which was in the environment, talking to the on-prem AD, talking to the on-prem exchange server, and so on and so forth. So if we look at the phones that now largely look to the internet and the devices that now don't look to the infrastructure, that's where that Windows 7 to Windows 10 breakpoint really sits in. So Windows 7 was designed to look left. It was designed to, le to look at infrastructure. Because, Jason, when was Windows 7 released, first released? Like, was it 15 years ago now? Close but, to that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's got to be a long time ago, right? So, so when was it getting thought about? When was it getting built? 20 years ago, right? So, you know, these things don't happen quickly. Uh, yeah. So it was, it was right to look there. It was, it was right to look to the left. But now Windows 10 was actually born with this idea of we need this thing to look right. But a lot of organisations have grappled, grappled with that and said, no, no, I still want it to look left. I still want it to talk to my AD. I still want it to talk to my exchange server rather than to look for 365 as your AD. And, and, and it, you know, as I say, I mean, I think um, fundamentally you're right. Um, it, 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 it wants to talk to the cloud first. But I think probably what's equally interesting is um, some of the processes or, or functionalities that, you know, businesses have traditionally used that, have held them back from moving um, away from Masoi. And I think um, one of those has been, and I um, had a bit of a, a post recently about the printers um, in the office. Um, and I think we could all agree that the use of a printer has completely disappeared in the office. Um, things like Sign Now and DocuSign enable you to send things to people electronically that they can sign. and. You know, I think there was a big fail with the JobKeeper um, applications that you know, Docu DocuSign wasn't used or SignNow wasn't used to send that to staff everywhere. For them Electronic to... signatures in general weren't used. And yeah, you know, like, to, to bear in on that one, it was an interesting one. I had to look it up for a personal reason when I was purchasing a car many years ago. But um, the Digital Signing Act, the Commonwealth yeah. Act of Australia, was signed into Parliament in 2000. It's right. a long time ago. 20 years ago, the Digital right. Signing Act was actually enacted um and and today we're still sitting here going um this process is still broken because of something as simple as a dll as a as a digital signing or or an update so we don't need to print things anymore um and i think that's what you know we've got to think about um 
what's holding back users and probably nothing and what's holding back IT teams that, you know, what, what's making the job hard for them to say, let's make that change. Um, and obviously users can get involved and say, well, we need our printers and, you know, ah, we, you know it's not going to work for us. But I think now everyone working from home has probably got to that point where I, actually we don't need it or we've found a different way. We're comfortable with it. We got used to it because it's been six, eight weeks of, of doing it now. Um, but the other one was traditional uh, or not traditional legacy apps. Um, and I know that, um, you know, there's different types of legacy apps, but you know, CRMs are largely in the cloud now. What are some of those other things? And um, Jason, are there, you know, examples that you've had that have you know, either stopped people or had to go and look at new ways of addressing applications? Yeah, look, I mean, if, if, if an organisation has a legacy application, like a, you know, a business critical ERP, it's not a modern... What about a good internet connection, Jason? <laughs> We've lost you, Jason. Um, Randall, what, I, I might throw to you that question. The, the joys of living... Uh, the um, so one of the other things that, that holds a lot of people back is if they have a business that's run on uh, a spreadsheet, for example, they can have all sorts of complex macros baked into those spreadsheets and yeah. without confidence and certainty around what those spreadsheets do and, and how they actually you know, maybe underpin financial forecasting or reporting, um, you know, you'd have to be pretty bold and pretty brave to want to actually meddle with that. And look, I wanted to go back to one of Randall's points before, especially the school one, it was really common, you know, during school holidays, whether it was a school or whether you're, you know, any other organisation, to try and use that downtime to make those incremental changes and, and modifications. And what we've got right now is almost like a bit of an out of band school holiday break, where we've all, you know, we've all run fast to try and work from home. Some for some organisations, it was really simple. It was, you know, the decision was made at lunchtime, and by the afternoon they were already working from home. And for some, it was a little bit more involved, but. Right now, we've got that perfect opportunity to have a look at what are those business processes that are holding you back because you've been forced to actually work. And some of those wrinkles actually appear and you could be forgiven, you know, for, for something not necessarily working. And, and another point that Randall made, which I want to expand on, is the future is really all about usability. It's about the user friendliness. Yep. You look at Apple over the last decade, the reason the iPhone and, and iPad took off was so incredibly user-intuitive. Even in, right now, right today, why has Zoom taken off over other platforms that have been around for a long time, like Skype and WebEx and GoToMeeting and Google's Meet and, and you know, even Teams? And it's simply because it's really straightforward to use. Yep. And that's going to be the key. To and do you comment before about how long we've been around? Might be 15 years. My, my memory is not that great, but it's actually built upon a platform that's over 30 years old. So they're slowly unpicking 30 years worth of legacy. But yeah. what they've got to now is something that is usable and easy, and that's going to be the piece that just makes it easier. So back to your your three stages before a provision update and manage. It's easier to provision because it's just like iOS or Android. It's out of the box. You you literally next next finish and, and away you go. Although may take a little bit longer than that. Um, you know, the updating, it's, it's all updated over the cloud. You don't have to worry about VPNs and capacity management issues with a legacy bit of VPN software or hardware that you may even still be running in a data center. And the ongoing management change and release management is, is greatly simplified. And once an organization can turn that corner and unpick that legacy that's really holding them back, it's gonna make life so much easier. It just, it, it'll ensure that users are happier, it's going to ensure greater, you know, staff um, uh, retention. It's going to make sure that people are more productive, that you can work from anywhere. You know, you, you, can, you can be flexible and work in the office or at yeah. home. Essentially, you can just be effective anywhere. So, so it's, not a, um, it's not a case of, you know, change to, um, you know, modern management. It's as simple as click, click, next. Um, so it's not that simple. Um, <laughs> but there's ways of getting you there and it's not... I um, think the... 80-20 needs to kick in, Sam. You know, yep. A lot of people are always scared of it. If I can't do it for everybody, I just won't do it. We'll, yeah. we'll stay where we are. Yep. Whereas now you need to look at it and go, well, the 80-20 just flipped on its head. I had 20% of people that used the VPN and now I've got 100% of people using the VPN. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. and we're all stuffed, right? Like if, if we had have taken this slice, and even if it's just a team uh, within a team and just saying, well, here's the sales team. They've all got nice new laptops anyway. Let's just put them out on modern management. 
and let's learn from that uh, is a great place to start. Yep. Uh, yep. Rather than trying to, to roll it out to the, to the whole organisation, just like we've done with introducing iOS into yep. the enterprise, introducing Android into the enterprise. Yeah, it, it was a net new and, and splitting your Windows 7, Windows 10, or even your Windows 10, Windows 10. So yep. Windows 10 traditionally managed and Windows 10 modern managed you know, is a good place to go. Because I, I think that the challenge being is that the, the speed of change that Microsoft wants it to drive at yep. and, and Windows 10 to update from is, is a regular frequent cadence like we're used to seeing with smartphones. Yeah. Not like we're used to seeing with desktops. So, you, so to keep up with that, you need new ways of thinking. You can't just turbocharge your snail and, and, and hope it goes the same way. Is the, is the term security in motion one that you came up with or is that somewhere else? Because I, I think that just encapsulates exactly what you're trying to do here. It's, it's security in motion. I think it's a byproduct of mobile and yep. cloud in yep. reality. Right? So I think as we move to the modern mobile OSs, Yep. Uh, and it was actually, I think it's one of the death knells of why BlackBerry as an OS actually failed. Right. The thing that made it successful was it was IT controllable. You could yep. say you're on BlackBerry version 4 and, and the OS could be locked down in a SOE type environment just like the desktop could of the era, of yep. XP probably of the same era, and, and IT loved that. But then when the iPhone came along and Apple said, well, no, you can't, it's the user that, that updates that and it moves with speed, People were comparing an iPhone to BlackBerry 4, whereas BlackBerry 6 and 7 was actually in market. But IT departments weren't letting their, their users have that newer experience. So the experience gap was, was quite significant. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know, like the IE wars of you know, Internet Explorer 6, I have to use that because it's got some ActiveX control that you know, works for some macro, for some sheet, for some internal intranet thing. Uh, and then I have Chrome for everything else. Yeah. Um, you know, and the smartest thing that Google ever did was, was allow Chrome, Chrome to be installed without admin rights uh, so that a user could, could get around and install it, right? So, so that's kind of the new frontier that we're working in. And security in motion is driven really from uh, you know, that, that idea that the cloud updates frequently, that yep. the OS updates frequently, and the app stack being cloud-driven apps updates frequently. So it's, it's fair to say that something should be changing every day. If something's not changing every day, you're probably becoming less secure. Yeah. Uh, in, in simple speak. Yep. Okay. I think that's, um, I think that's probably a wrap. Um, Jason, thank you um, for your insights. Um, Randall. Is this um, where we insert and say like and comment below, except we're not on YouTube? And, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Subscribe and like uh, yeah. below. Uh, help our channel expand. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Today's uh, episode was brought to you by uh, Richie Logic. Yeah. yeah. And right. Lego. And so what's what's yours in the background there, Jason? A trek. A trek. There we go. And I don't have one. Well, he's got a budgie. What's that? Uh, a budgie. Uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Been a great session. Cheers, guys. Thanks.